Tschüss. Come on. There we go. Let's go back. Why is it not? Oh well, I guess I'm gonna be using a keyboard. All right. <laughs> Well, thank you everybody for coming to uh, this talk today and thank you Swift Hero so much for inviting me. This is really fantastic. This is the second time I've spoken at Swift Heroes, first time like in person, which is really good. Um, a little bit about myself. My name is Leo Dion. Um, I'm on Twitter at Leo G. Dion, Mastodon, Leo G. Dion at C.im. Uh, I've been a developer for 20 years, C Sharp, PHP, JavaScript, I've done it all iOS for 10. Uh, my company is Bright Digit. You can check it out at brightdigit.com. Uh, I do freelance and consulting work. So if you or your company needs help, please reach out to me. Um, I have my own podcast, empowerapps.show. A few of the speakers have been on there as guests. I have a YouTube channel also, uh, youtube.com slash brightdigit, um, where I talk about iOS development. Uh, I, it's been a really crazy week for me. Uh, I actually, if you can tell from my shirt, I was at Deep Dish Swift. Luckily, I didn't speak there, thank God, because two talks in one week would drive me crazy. But um, it was a fantastic conference, and uh, then right after that, uh, I came here to Turin for this wonderful conference here at Swift Heroes, which I'm really excited about. So I, I've had a whole week of Swift talks uh, and enjoying all of them, and it's been really fantastic. So um, I'm not crazy yet, I'm not hallucinating luckily, so that's all good. Um, but I'm really excited to talk today, and specifically talking about generics, associated types, and uh, how this is related to unit testing. If you checked out uh, Yukai's talk yesterday, he really did a good job kind of breaking down how, how that works within the language. And today I really want to explain, well, kind of what do generics and associate, associated types actually provide uh, for your app, like what, what power do they actually give you? And then we'll talk about why they can be so difficult to use. <laughs> uh, I think we've all had challenges trying to deal with them. And then we'll build a simple networking library using generics and protocols and associated types and see why, why they make sense in that kind of use case. And then lastly, we'll talk about how testing is involved in all of this and how, the, how it fits. So what do generics do? Um, a really good explanation that I got, and I'll cite this WWDC talk later, but um, a really good explanation is generics are kind of a form of polymorphism. Uh, that's a really long word, which basically means that uh, object can do multiple things or it can take in multiple things, and, and polymorph, it can change, right? So um, the way I think about it is it's like variables, but for types. And what I mean here is you'll have a simple statement here, right, like let x equal one. Like that's a variable, it stands for something, it stands for the value one, right? And that's kind of the same idea with, with generics. We have a generic type where there's some variable, kind of think of the X as a variable for a type. It can be any type, we don't know. Um, there's three main types of polymorphism. Uh, back when I first started learning programming, there was just the, the one that was very simple, is called ad hoc polymorphism where you have a method. A method could take in a UI kit view, it could take in a Swift UI view, you don't know. But you know if you threw in either of those, the compiler would know, oh, we're gonna call this version and, or we're gonna call that version. The compiler take, takes care of that all for you, which is really great. And then um, 
in the old days, when we were doing Objective-C and UI kit, uh, we were stuck with having to do subclasses. Anybody here has ever created a UI view controller? You know exactly what I'm talking about here, right? You have a UI, UI view controller that has to be overwritten or subclassed in order for it to be used in UI kit. That's because it's a limitation of Objective-C. So we always create subtypes. The problem with this, of course, is that you have no concept of like an abstract class, right? So you end up throwing in like a fatal error saying, hey, you're supposed to implement this thing that takes in an NS coder or who knows what, right? So that's, you know, it's okay, but it could run into some issues. Uh, generics though are really the Swifty way of doing it. It's the way that Swift intends you to uh, be able to implement multiple ways of doing things. And Part of that, part of the problem though, is that once we start doing this, we end up with all sorts of issues in Xcode that kind of are cryptic and don't really help us understand what the heck is going on. I, I thought I was doing this right, and then you get all these errors and you're like, what the heck, what did I do wrong? Probably part of that problem is that there's some misconceptions about how generics work in Swift. It isn't like a C++ template or a C Sharp uh, generic or whatever other language generic or template uh, you're using. It's something very, uh, not very different, but it's done in a different way in Swift. And I think we come at it with these misconceptions. Luckily for us, Swift 5.7 has made it a bit easier. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And also, um, it's important to understand that what you're really doing here is separating the ideas from what a type does. You wanna sep separate the implementation from what you expect a certain object to do. So today we're gonna to talk uh, specifically about networking. So let's, this is kind of the simplest sort of method I could come up with where it takes in a request and it gives us data back. Um, and it does this all through a URL session. Uh, but there's a few problems with this. Uh, for one thing, it doesn't take in a strongly typed request. It just takes in this simple request. Well, what if you like want to make it even simpler to add a uh, to-do list item or add a user or do a login? You don't want to have this simple request. You want to say, here's the user, add it to the database for me, um, things like that. And what we get back is just data. We don't get back um, something that's been JSON decoded and like something that's strongly typed that we can actually use. Uh, it doesn't deal with authorization or status codes. We can't do different decoders. What if you need form encoding? What if you need, I don't know, what else? XML, God forbid. Um, but, you know, and it's all tightly coupled with URL sessions, so we can't use different implementations of networking here. Again, here's some of the code for building the request and making the request. But what we want to do is we want to have a function, very simple function, takes in a request of some type, and it gives us a success type. You, if you add a to-do list item, you get back the new to-do to -do list item with the new ID. So in order to do this, we're gonna, have, we're gonna use generics, and since we have these two types here that we're using in our method, we have to put them in uh, angular brackets to note that these are the two types that can be any type whatsoever that we can give it and we get it back. And so we're gonna change this to take in a request type and give us back a success type. So let's go ahead and do that. And if we try to compile this, we're gonna get an error. It doesn't know anything about requ requires credentials. It doesn't know anything about how, well, first of all, we're returning data instead of the success type. And then when we actually build the request, it, it's gonna give us all sorts of errors about how request type doesn't have the methods that we expect out of it. So now, what do we need to do in order to make sure that request type fulfills a sort of like protocol of some sort? So what we're gonna do is have uh, tell our function that it needs to be a generic request and the success type needs to be able to be decoded. And then we're gonna define those requirements for generic request using a protocol. So we're gonna say, if you're gonna be a request of any type, you need to give us a path to the URL, whatever query parameters, the method, headers, the body of the request, and whether it needs any sort of credentials attached to it when you make the networking call. 
Uh, this is a really great WWDC talk, write this down, but uh, Holly had, did a really good job last year explaining how Swift generics work. And one of the quotes I really liked was, a protocol is an abstraction tool that describes the functionality of conforming types. Using a protocol, you can separate the ideas about what a type does from its implementation details. Let me say that part again. Using a protocol, you can separate the ideas about what a type does from the implementation details, and this is really important. What we want is we want to say, I don't care how you give me a path, how you give me the HTTP method, do it whatever way you want to, but as long as you fulfill this requirement, I can use this in an HTTP request. So we now add the requirements for our request and our success type, and there's a few other ways we can do this as well. Um, You've probably seen where constraints. That's another way you can do it. This is the same equivalent way of doing the, exactly the same thing, obviously a bit wordier. But in some cases, you might need a where clause um, to be more exact or precise. Um, and then, of course, we have the one that we end up using here where we have the uh, just we have it within the Angular bracket what protocol it implements. But we could also use uh, a keyword, sum. Um, Yukai, of course, did a really great job explaining some a bit. But the reason we can do this is because we're saying we don't care what generic request it is. We don't need the type. We don't need to know what specific type it is. We just know that we can get back, we can take in any generic request we want and return the success type. Now, you may be asking, why can't we use some for the success type? Well, part of the problem is that when you have some in the return type, it has to be the same type every time. Um, so this is, a, this is a problem you'll see, especially with Swift UI. So if you've ever done any Swift UI, you know that in the body, usually it returns back uh, a sum view. You also run into the issue with this JSON decoding here, where we need to know what type we're decoding. If we used sum, we wouldn't, like, what's the type? We don't know what the type is, because we're only saying sum decodable. Like I said, a parameter can be any type but the return has to be the same type every time. And like I had said, with Swift UI, you'll get this error here if you try to do that. Now you're probably thinking, wait a second, I know for a fact I've had an if statement or an if clause within a body, why does that work but not this? Well part of the, pro well, part of the problem or the solution to this is that what Swift UI does is it uses a view builder to automatically take that and put it in some sort of group so if you return the, if you remove the, um, you can see here the list and the progress view don't aren't the same type, so that's why it gives us an issue. And so what it does is it uses a view builder here. If you remove the return type, it automatically uses the view builder to then create that view for you, which underneath it might just end up being a group. I don't know exactly how SwiftUI does it. And one of the big advantages of sum and why sum came with SwiftUI is if we were to actually say what type this returns, it would be some awful long string with 15 generics attached to it. So luckily for us, Apple introduced the sum keyword, so we don't have to say specifically what generic type ends up being returned from the body. So like I had said, we can't use sum for the success type here, but there is a way we can use the success type. We know that the success type will always depend on the generic request, right? So if I say, give me the list of to-do items, it will give me back the list of to-do items every time. We know exactly for each request what the return type will be. And so this is where we can come and go ahead and add an associated type to our struct for, or excuse me, to our protocol for generic request. So now we know every generic request has to have a success type associated with it. And we know that that success type has to be decodable. Now you're probably wondering, okay, now that we've done that, we can actually use some decodable because we'll know exactly what type we're returning for each generic request. But then you're probably asking, what do we put in here for the type? How are we gonna know the type if we're only saying some decodable? Well, luckily for us, we can grab the type of the request, and we can grab the success type of that request because it is a property of the type itself. Let me repeat that. So we know the request, we can grab the type, we know the type is the generic request, 
We can do dot success type and refer back to the success type of that generic request and then use that type itself to then go ahead and decode the data. Pretty cool. I like this a lot. It's a little bit weird because you're kind of dealing with metadata here, but it, it works really well and it creates really clean code without having to refer to the specific types. Now we have successfully supplied a strongly typed request object. We receive a strongly typed response object. So for instance, if we say list object, we throw in a list object request, we'll get back the list of objects pretty easily. And we've automatically are dealing with authorization and status codes depending on how we implement generic requests. We haven't done anything with encoders and decoders and I'm not probably gonna do that today, but we could if we wanted to. But the problem is we don't allow for different implementations of URL session. And so this is where it's important to kind of abstract the networking part. Because in some cases, we don't want to do it the same way. A good reason for this is that, well, 99% of the time we're going to do stuff on the iPhone. There's other ways of doing networking in Swift. Uh, if you're doing anything on the server directly, you might want to use Swift Neo, which is kind of the base networking library for servers in Swift. If you're doing, doing anything with Vapor, you might want to deal with the Vapor client. But today I want to specifically focus on testing and being able to test using mocks. Again, go back to this quote here. We are, we're changing the implementation details. We don't care about the implementation details when we call this function. We just want a protocol that says, I would promise to do the networking for you, and it automatically does it for us. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna replace parts of our code base so that it doesn't tightly coupled with URL session. What we're gonna do is create a protocol called generic service. This generic service will um, give us, will just do the request for us. We don't care how it does it, just as long as it does it. But then we get a problem here where it says that the sum type cannot be the return of a protocol requirement. Problem being, this is a protocol where you can't just say it's gonna return some decodable. It has to, we have to denote exactly what that type is gonna be. The result type, again, depends on the specific generic request. So we need to, again, go back and use a type parameter. We need to specifically say what the name of the request will be. So we go ahead, we put the angle brackets in, we say it has to be a generic request, and then we know the success type because it's the associated type of the request is that success type. Now, now this will compile just fine, so we're gonna go ahead and implement this. And instead of having URL request, we're gonna use our, we're gonna set up a whole series of types for the session. We're gonna say that there's a protocol called generic session, uh, which URL session will implement, and then uh, it will give it, build the request for us, and then it will take that request and give us back data that we can then, uh, that it can then be decoded. So in our implementation, rather than tightly coupling to URL session, we're gonna say, I don't care if it's URL session, it can be any session. Just as long, and literally any session, just as long as it does the job that it says it's supposed to do. So now in our request, we go ahead and replace all mentions of URL request or URL session with our brand new protocols. But then we get a problem. How do we say, how do we say that generic session could be a URL request? So then what we're gonna need to do is gonna, gonna take those set of types that URL session and URL request provide, and we're gonna say they're gonna implement our generic session request and our generic session protocols. So here's our protocols, and then we're gonna go ahead and add implementations using extensions for URL session and generic session so that it implements those protocols. All right, so this should work. Now we take in, we don't care about the, um, the implementation of URL session, we just care that it, it does the job. But then we get this problem right here. Member data cannot be used on value any generic session, consider using generic constraint instead. So what's going on here? The problem is we supplied that any keyword. And if you checked out Ukai's talk, you know any kind of puts it in a box. But part of that problem is 
we have an associated type attached to it here because we're saying any generic session, but that's not technically true. The generic session has to take in a specific request type. And what request type it gives us might not be the request type that we give it when we call the data method. When we, when we put that any keyword in, we lose all sense of like what the associated type is. So then it doesn't know what, you know, it doesn't know that the request you get back is a request that it can take. What we're gonna need to do is find a way to say, no, 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 this session is a session of a specific request type, and it takes that request type. Therefore, in our implementation of the generic service, we're gonna use what's called a primary associated type. And this is something fairly new in Swift. Before, you didn't have a way to say, this protocol takes in the specific associated type. Now we have that ability. So what you do is you take the associated type, you put it in angle brackets at the top there, and then that way when you use the any keyword, you can specify what request type that protocol implements. So now, we're, uh, if you look at the bottom here, you see that the session, we say, we end up adding a generic to our implementation called generic request type. And then we say that we don't care what generic session is, just as long as it's a generic session of whatever request type we, uh, we create when we create this object. So let's go ahead and take a look at how this is useful in the case of testing. So now we're gonna create a mock. We're gonna create our own implementation of this generic session type, and we're gonna create a mock version of it. We don't care, we, like the mock version, obviously with any good unit test, it's not gonna actually do networking. We just want it to pretend like it's gonna do networking, so that way we can test this and make sure our business logic works. Uh, we have just a simple closure that it takes, where it takes in the request and gives us a response. Um, and then in our response, we just call that closure for the data call. We build the request, which is our own set of request objects. And then we're gonna implement our test. So here's our test here. We say that we um, have some sort of success object here that we expect at the end. We create a random request that we're gonna pass to our generic service. We create an expectation, so we make sure that it calls that request from response method below. And then we create some random headers, a uh, random URL. We pass in the closure. Uh, in that closure, we're gonna make sure that the base URL components match, the headers match, the requests match, and then we're gonna fulfill that expectation and make sure that the expectation is fulfilled uh, once that response is created. We return our expected response, and then below, we create our service with uh, the expected base URL, the expected headers, et cetera. And then we call the request. We get the actual response back, and then we just make sure what we told it was, what we told was gonna return is actually returned. And then at the end, we of course check that everything was fulfilled here. What's nice about abstracting a lot of this away, removing the tight coupling between networking and our business logic is that we have flexibility in the requests and the results we expect. We have flexibility in different content types, so if we wanted to plug in it, we could do the same thing with the JS coder, right? Or encoder or decoder. We can say, hey, we want you to use form, form formatting or form content type, we could do that. We have flexibility in the underlying implementation. If you wanted to plug in Alamo Fire, you could do that here. If you want to plug in Swift Neo, we can implement that. And last but not least, we can easily mock different implementations for testing purposes. We're not locked down uh, to testing using actual URL session. Obviously with Objective-C there was a lot more funny stuff we can do with swizzling and all that, but with Swift we can't do that, but at least we have generics here to do that for us. Polymorphism is to types what variables are to values and objects. I think that's a really good starting point when it comes to what polymorphism can do. And when it comes to Swift, generics and protocols are the fundamental way to do this in Swift. Also, we learned today what the sum keyword does. It's an opaque type that defines a specific object, and it must re be returned as the same type every time. If you need to refer to the actual type names in your function, you can use 
uh, Angular brackets and then have a type name, which then you could refer to in your code. If you need, if it doesn't matter how a protocol is implemented, you can use the any keyword, which means it describes any object uh, that implements that specific protocol and it can be changed into different types if needed. And then if you need a specific any type where it has a specific associated type attached to it, this is where a primary associated type is the way to go. So what can you do now with your code base? Slowly find ways to modularize your code. I can't emphasize this enough. Modularize, modularize, I hate saying that word. Modularize, modularize, modularize. Split your code up into small components as much as you possibly can. It's easier on your brain and it's easier on testing. Please do this. Be implementation agnostic. Don't care how something is implemented and start using protocols more liberally in your code so that way you're not tightly coupled between different implementations. This allows for easier mocking and therefore easier testing. And then use generics so that your API is a lot more friendly and you don't have to kind of guess or cast some object into a different type. If you want to look at the step-by-step -step process I follow today, uh, this URL here is to a um, comparison between a, a networking library that I'm using and it follows the step-by-step -step process I followed here today, so please check that out. Leave that up for just a little bit, okay. Thank you so much, uh, Swift Heroes, for having me today. <laughs>